fight or flight response. This is what we're going to focus on a lot. And everyone knows about the classic symptoms of fight or flight response. Increased sympathetic activity, blood pressure, heart rate, changes in respiration, so on and so forth. And, and a fight or flight response is enormously adaptive in situations where there is real, honest to God, danger. And so people and animals alike get mobilized and they run like hell or they fight to save their life. However, in, in the real world of animals and probably early humans, these fight or flight responses probably lasted between two and five minutes at the most. Because if you're confronted by a lion or something like that in two, three, four, five minutes, you're either safe or you're dead. And so this massive change in, in metabolic activity uh, has an immediate outlet and for one reason or another, it's going to be over in a few minutes. Doesn't stay around very long. And that's pro problematic though in human beings today because people oftentimes are exposed to stressors that don't go away in, in five minutes or so. Here, let me give you some examples, okay? When I can personally relate to. Okay. Well, I hope I don't offend anybody, but uh, here's another one. Okay. Okay, there we go. So, anywhere, anyway, something uh, somewhere went terribly wrong. And, and this is going to be a point we're going to come back to really quite a lot, and, and that is that people's choices, their lifestyle choices, in many respects, may lead to a richer life, but also may put people on thin ice in terms of their ability uh, psychologically and biologically to cope with. So how have humans screwed things up? That doesn't sound very scientific, but here are the four main ways, okay? First off, ongoing abuse, and this is almost unique, almost unique in the animal kingdom. Uh, there are, among monkeys and apes and some other mammals, uh, bullying, uh, it's dominance hierarchy, and so the alpha male goes over and you know, knocks over the, the, uh, su the submissive male. So you, there's some of that, but, but by and large, extremely severe ongoing abuse it is seen a lot more in humans than it is in animals out in the wild. Human beings have the capacity to engage in extremely severe psychological, sexual, physical abuse, pathologically, uh, pathological neglect, for instance. Okay, so that we're going to see that that's a huge issue in terms of brain development. Substance abuse. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, a chart that I, I sent to all of you really complicated chart, and the pathways we're going to look at are sometimes referred to as the brain stress circuits, and these are well-defined nerve pathways between various structures in the brain, and they get activated during fight or flight responses. Well, all kinds of substance abuse can make it for a really big problem, uh, alcohol, marijuana, so on and so forth. However, it's really with uh, methamphetamine and cocaine that these particular brain stress circuits get activated, and they get activated orders of magnitude beyond what any person or animal would ever experience in nature. And the results of that can be can be devastating. Uh, human beings engage in negative self-talk. You know, you can think about, oh my God, you know, what's going to happen? Is my wife going to leave me? Or so projecting into the future and worrying about stuff, also ruminating about the past. You know, I should have done. I should have done a better job. You know, I got fired. And if I didn't, why, didn't, why didn't see the writing on the wall? So, I like this term: recirculating experiences. Rather than being kind of in the moment, then people are engage a lot in uh, regrets about things that have happened in the past and worries about the future. Okay, it's highly unlikely that gazelles do this. Uh, probably not the case today. Gazelles saying, "Oh my God." I, hope I don't prematurely lose my antlers or you know, something like that. Uh, probably, I mean nobody knows, but probably most mammals are kind of in the moment. They're sort of like zen, okay? All right. And then finally, screwy lifestyles. There's a whole bunch of different versions of this, but top of the list uh, are, are choices and problems with getting adequate sleep. And we're going to see if that's a huge issue. Okay, so we've talked about the limbic system before. Uh, we're going to come back to this again. You remember I said that we'll take many different passes through some of this material, and I think it's going to get to the place where all of you are going to be really familiarized with the various brain structures and their function. Go back here for just a second.
Now, in the limbic system, uh, there are several brain structures that we're going to be talking about. I've mentioned these before. Let me briefly show these to you again. Okay, this brain structure here. Oops, pulse. My computer is out of control here. Okay, where is it? Okay, this brain structure right here is is the hippocampus, and like every brain structure except the pineal gland, it has two of them. One in the right hemisphere, one in the left hemisphere. And as we've talked about, uh, this is enormously important for memory, the ability to learn new material, but also very, very important uh, in regulating emotions. And we're going to see the damage to the hippocampus can uh, really set the stage for a much greater likelihood of developing major depression. Okay. Right next door to the hippocampus uh, is the amygdala. It's about the size of my thumbnail. Again, there's one in the left, one in the right uh, temporal lobes, and we're going to see that this plays a significant role in threat appraisal. We'll spend a lot of time talking about that later today. Here's the corpus callosum right here. Okay, now right above this, stretching from the frontal lobes back, back here, is, is the cingulate gyrus. And it, it does a lot of stuff, okay? We're going to be focusing mostly on things that occur, for better and for worse, in the anterior cingulate, which is technically a part of the frontal lobes. Okay, So those are three limbic structures. Remember I said earlier in the class we're not going to cover you know, dozens and dozens. We're going to really focus on the ones that, that are most relevant. And, and then closely tied in with these three limbic brain structures is the hypothalamus. And of course, we talked about this before. Uh, here's a bigger picture of this. Hypothalamus has various groups of, of cell bodies here. Uh, one of these is the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and that particular structure is responsible for uh, monitoring and, and maintaining circadian rhythm, for instance. Uh, but it's, it's a lot more to it than that. It, it's a place where an enormous amount of things occur. It regulates, it's really responsible for regulating most hormonal actions in the body. It's the launching site for the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, very, very important in terms of emotional regulation. And then here's the pituitary gland. Some people believe it's just actually a, a, an extension of the hypothalamus. And uh, we'll be talking about these two brain structures quite a bit.